Good morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. On this Thursday, March 4th, we are studying Mark chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. As Jesus travels in the area of Jericho, a blind man, Bartimaeus, cries out to Jesus for mercy, and the Lord shows his compassion yet again. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's word today, we have with us returning guest, Pastor Kurt Cochran. Pastor Cochran serves at Faith Lutheran Church in Tucson, Arizona. Pastor Cochran, welcome back to Sharp Iron. Glad to be here. Thank you very much. So we get started this morning. Let's talk context. We're at the end of Mark chapter 10. What do we need to know about the book of Mark as a whole, the preceding following context that'll help us into these verses today? Sure thing. Well, you'll notice their um, very next section, the triumphal entry, so Palm Sunday, comes immediately after this text. I use that word immediately, intentionally. That's Mark's favorite word. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so this event um, is somewhere between six months before Palm Sunday and Palm Sunday itself, um, since the immediately time, time marker doesn't give us too much indication. We're not quite sure when that would be, but it's somewhere in that six months that he's just kind of hanging out around Jerusalem. And uh, these last three chapters that you guys have been going through uh, have really focused on Jesus's identity, who he is um, as God and man, his mission that he's come for, and what it means, especially for followers of him. And this blind man, once he's, he's healed, once he's made well, once he's saved, uh, he's going to follow Jesus, disciple him on the way, on the road, and this road that's going to be going to Palm Sunday, to the cross and to the resurrection, the ascension that we follow as well. Uh, so a lot of this has been on discipleship, and this is wrapping up the the big section on discipleship and the identity of Jesus. The theme of discipleship in this section of Mark really got started with an account of a blind man. There's a there's a bit of a, a bookend in this transitional section in Mark's gospel. If you go back to chapter 8, Jesus heals a blind man right before he asks his disciples who he is and then reveals to them very plainly what it means that he is the Christ, that he will suffer, die, and rise. So here on the other end, right before he goes into that week of his suffering, death, resurrection, we've got another account of a healing of a blind man. What is it about this healing of, of a blind person that says something about the life of discipleship? Sure, yeah. Well, and I think a, a big clue in that is if you go back to the last time that Jesus healed a blind man in Mark, so Mark chapter 8, starting at verse 22, that you noticed but you go back to the section right before that, and Jesus speaks about, uh, watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Uh, this was just after he fed the 4,000. Um, and they already had been saying, well, we forgot bread and we're on this <laughs> boat. And then he goes off and says, speaking more uh, catechetically, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And like, well, it's great, but we still have no bread. And Jesus says, well, hold on, you're not getting it. He says, do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? And then this one, having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? Do you not remember? Uh, and he continues to try and, and catechize them into what these things are meaning more than the mere miracles themselves. Uh, he is instructing on the feeding of the 4,000. Um, speaking on the number symbolism, when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They said to him, 12. And the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. And Jesus said to them, do you not yet understand? <laughs> and then immediately we have the healing of the blind man at Bethsaida, Mark chapter 8. And this whole section on what it means to follow him. And I think that clue at the beginning is to show that 
what it means is to learn from him, to learn the true doctrine that's not the leaven of the Pharisees, the leaven of Herod, to learn and follow um, where he's taking us. And where he's taking us is the cup that I uh, drink, um, the uh, baptism with which I'm baptized with, that is to say, taking up the cross and following him, but also through the sacraments, through baptism and the Lord's Supper. Mm. I kind of love the um, how, how he says, do you not yet understand? It kind of gives me the imagery of, of a guy who's telling a joke, and then um, whenever people just stare at him with blank faces, they don't get the joke. He kind of says, do you get it? Do you get the joke? Do you get it? <laughs> well, here, this is definitely not a joke that Jesus is giving, but he kind of looks at them and saying, come on, guys. Are you getting it? Mm. Well, you will. <laughs> he, and the will is at the very end when the Jesus will open up their eyes uh, that they will see all of these things that have taken place. Uh, this comes out most especially in Luke in the resurrection account, um, especially with the um, oh uh, road to Emmaus, that they have their eyes opened to behold the meaning of all of these things that have taken place. So clearly, sight and blindness are literal. We definitely want to keep the literal sense of Jesus healing blindness. Bartimaeus was actually blind. The man at Bethsaida was actually blind. I mean, shoot, we can go through all of the blind accounts. There's a lot of them. The man in John, um, and then there's another one at the beginning of Matthew. Uh, Jesus loves healing blind people because I would say two things. The first is it's a direct prophecy from Isaiah 35 of the Messiah. The Messiah is going to be one who heals blindness, just straight connection to the Old Testament. And um, perhaps this Bartimaeus, he even maybe have heard of some of these other blind men being healed and then made the connection himself to healing from blindness and being the Messiah and the Messiah is going to be the son of David. That might be one of the signs that caused this Bartimaeus to be able to confess son of David, have mercy on me because he's healing all those other blind men. That must mean he's not a mere miracle worker, but rather son of God, son of man, son of David. And then the, if I can, and then the second point, I got to get the second point in there uh, is that the blindness is also we're sinfully kept from being enlightened. Uh, if there's an opposite word to blindness, spiritually speaking, it would be enlightened. If we are um, blinded, we are kept back from uh, being able to understand, being able to perceive, as Jesus put it. But when we have our blindness taken from us, then we can take into account what Jesus would have us see. I appreciate you bringing up both of those points. We don't want to over-spiritualize Jesus' miracles and forget that Jesus was actually healing people who needed healing. It was not a part of God's original design for his creation that people would be blind or get sick and suffer. That came about as a consequence of, of sin. And so Jesus comes to undo that. And so we shouldn't lose sight, lose sight of the fact that when Jesus physically heals someone, that is good in and of itself. And, and it is certainly a, a Jesus fulfilling what was spoken about him in the Old Testament. At the same time, the way the gospel writers give it to us, and I think Mark is no exception, is to invite us to reflect upon what does it mean for us to see Jesus truly. And as you said, we we get that in Mark chapter 8. We're getting it here again in, in Mark chapter 10. I think it's it's telling that you know in, in Mark, the moment that someone really sees Jesus truly is at his cross— in Mark chapter 15, the centurion is the first human figure in the gospel of Mark to call Jesus the son of God. We got that back in Mark chapter one from the evangelist. And then it's the centurion at the cross who finally confesses it about Jesus, that he's the son of God, that particular title. And and what has Jesus just gotten done teaching his disciples in the previous verse? It's that the son of man came to give his life as a ransom for many. And now here he's going to heal this blind man, what what's going to open your eyes, disciples? It is going to be the the death of Jesus on the cross as as that moment that causes them to see Jesus as he truly is. And I really think that that this text, the, even as I've been reflecting on it 
before this conversation. There's so much in this that really does bring elements from this section on discipleship. I mean, I think we can we can make comparisons and contrast to the request that James and John have just made to that rich young man who came to Jesus, to the little children who were brought to Jesus, to to the disciples and in, in all of their what how did you say, you know, kind of that blank stare, do you get it? It wasn't just there in chapter eight. Right? They've been doing that throughout this section. Multiple times they just sort of look at Jesus kind of like what? <laughs> and mm-hmm. and 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 then there's that, you know, we've got the father who brings his boy with the demon to Jesus. A, a lot of those themes that have been brought up in this section, I, I think are really going to come into focus here with the healing of Bartimaeus. Before we, one more thing before we get into the text, Pastor Cochran, is that this is a, a text that we do see in Matthew and Luke as well. Uh, Mark, you know, he, he likes the word immediately and he's often known for his brevity, but on many occasions he will give more detail than the other two synoptic gospels. This is one of those occasions where he gives some extra detail that isn't in Matthew and Luke, just in terms of, of some of those comparisons and contrasts. When we look at the synoptic gospels, anything to, to point out from the way Mark records this as compared to Matthew and Luke? Yeah, that's a, a wonderful question because we often hear from the history channel, um, or if you're in the university setting, you might hear this in the classroom. Uh, this major big idea that's being pushed about Mark had to be the first of the gospel to be written because there is, well, it's shorter. It's only 16 chapters on the whole. And on most occasions, Mark is going to be the one who writes the least amount. And Matthew and Luke tends to write more. And John is its own animal, of course. Um, but when it comes to this text, we take notice, as you said, well, it's longer and there's more detail. So, it tends to be the case that Mark writes less detail than Matthew and Luke, but it's not always the case. But we should think on um, when it comes to this idea. Um, oh, you and I were talking about it before we went on here about how the um, you put it really well, how the. Um, oh, goodness, the uh, assumption of the idea that Mark wrote first is that. Uh, well, first of all, how Matthew and Luke, they just couldn't have had then the work of the Holy Spirit for them to write their Gospels, that Matthew and Luke had to have some source material to rely and then expand on. And then I think it was what you said here, um, that the uh, Mark is um, a little bit more just focused on on Jesus and therefore um Matthew and Luke, they um, are just kind of filling in some some of the details. And right. And I think just to, that. well, that's right. And uh, just to because because we did talk a little bit about this. And I think something that that, again, some of those unbelieving scholars, or at least it comes out of a place of unbelief, is that Mark presents sometimes it's phrased like this, a very human Jesus. And we've probably even said that here, you know, Jesus will act in, in kind of strange ways and you, you definitely see the human nature in Christ. And so sometimes I think the assumption is, well, Mark wrote that way because for him, you know, he didn't quite believe that Jesus was fully God. And what happens in Matthew and Luke is that it gets developed. And there's this, this idea that somehow the doctrine got developed rather than as, as we would confess that no, Matthew, Mark, Luke, they all believe that Jesus truly is the son of God in human flesh, you know, two natures in one person. And so one of the ways that that, that unbelief sometimes shows up is in this idea of Mark and priority for the reason, again, that Mark has a, maybe it might be said like this, a lower Christology. He doesn't think of, of Jesus quite as highly as Matthew and Luke. And again, that's, that's yeah. simply just not and- true. Right, and we can actually even connect this to the prior blind man healing back in chapter 8. Uh, you remember it was a weird one. Yeah. Uh, how he, it was kind of a two-step miracle. He first spit on his eyes, uh, asking if uh, he, if the man saw anything, and the man looked up and was like, well, I see halfway. I see men, but they look like trees walking. Uh, then Jesus laid his hands on the, the man again, and he opened his eyes, and the sight was restored clearly. That that comes to us is, is kind of weird, and I'm sure you guys unpacked it whenever you, you were at that part. But that is something that I think the academic scholars, those who approach the scriptures, um, not necessarily with the eyes of faith, uh, but they would see that and say, huh, this seems primitive. This seems like it was probably the most accurate 
to what originally happened, and that when Matthew and Luke come along, the religion of Christianity is so established between themselves that they then look at a text like this and say, well, we can't keep that because that is something that is makes Jesus seem like he's only a halfway healer. He's not fully God. So therefore, um, Mark's got to be the one that comes first, and Matthew and Luke are the ones who are just trying to get the religion, really a religion they don't themselves believe in the academic sphere, uh, they're just trying to get it started um, to gain popularity. So we got to be careful with this and to put the the finest of points on on um, Mark or Matthew writing first and why it matters as well. We should remember that 1786, the very specific year of 1786, was the first time that anybody in the church ever suggested Mark as the first gospel. I guarantee you, you're not going to hear that from the History Channel. Um, But it's true that the church was unanimous on Matthew being the first gospel. And and there's so much external evidence, even in the early church, that uh, Matthew had written first. So just be careful with why. It's always the question you want to ask if anybody says that Mark was the first writer of the gospels. Why are they so insistent on making that point? Uh, it's coming from a particular position of of unbelief that we should look for. Now, there are some in the church, to be sure, that have heard the arguments, have weighed the arguments, and still believe that Mark is first. So we're, that's a discussion worth having with them since there's there's an argument. But that being said, it is worth taking note that before 1786, nobody in the church thought that Mark was first. That's right. And when it comes to that conversation, uh, paying attention to your own and whoever you're talking to, the presuppositions that are there, how are you coming to this? Are you coming to it from an, a place of faith that, yes, this is all the inspired word of God, and, and we really want to, to look and have this conversation? Or, as you said, when it comes to many academic settings, is it coming out of a, faith, a place of unbelief? That, that just wants to deny that this is the word of God or, or finds, again, some sort of development in Christianity rather than simply confessing that this is the word of God that has been given to us, that reveals to us who Jesus is as the Christ, the son of the living God, so that we would believe and have life in him. And that's what Mark's doing. And, yeah, and then I'll add one last thing on that is that you got to keep in mind the one main assumption that the academic sphere will approach all of the scriptures and that is that miracles cannot happen. Mm, right. And that's huge because um, whenever you realize that's the lens they're looking through everything. And so what is the miracle that can't happen with the scriptures, with the gospels, with who wrote first? Well, it's that Matthew and Luke can, in fact, be inspired by the Holy Spirit to write perfectly. That the Holy Spirit can take the perfection that Matthew and Luke now have in eternity and actually just bring that forward in time to when they're writing the gospels. And that their gospels can be written with Um, absolute accuracy as promised by Jesus. Um, When he sends the Holy Spirit, he will give them a perfect memory of all that Jesus spoke and did with them. So we say, amen. The academic sphere said, oh, we don't necessarily want to go that far that quick. Well, all right, you can, but we're going to be in the church and we're going to believe. That's right. And it's such a, it's a so much more joyful way to read the scriptures that I can I can come to the text and know that this is what God has provided for to be recorded for me so that I can know who he is as my savior. It's so much more joyful to read the scriptures that way than to be standing over them trying to figure out what I think is true and what's not and what I like and what I don't. And it's just like this is the word of God and and what joy there is to simply read it for that. And to be fed by it, to be you know, convicted by the law, raised to life by the gospel. It's just such a, a much more joyful way, not to mention faithful, of course, but just a more joyful way to read the scriptures with, with that in mind. So let's read the scriptures. Mark chapter 10. Yes. Speaking, of, <laughs> speaking of joy, that's right. Bartimaeus has a whole lot of joy today that we should get to. Yep. That's right. That's right. So we're in Mark chapter 10, beginning at verse 46. And they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up, he's calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way. 
your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. That is our text for today, Mark 10, verses 46 through 52. Pastor Cochran, perhaps the the place to start is one of the details that Mark does give us that we don't find in Matthew and Luke, and that's the name of the blind man, Bartimaeus. In fact, and and maybe you could address this as well, Matthew and Luke both talk about two blind men being healed. Mark tells us about one Bartimaeus. Give Give us some of those details that Mark is giving us here. Sure, and this shouldn't bother us that even though there would be two men being um, made well in this account, uh, once you compare Matthew and Luke, the fact that Mark decides to just simply hone in on one of them, that's just simply another way of telling the story. <clears throat> it's not something that is um, contradictory or even apparent contradiction. It's just simply Mark saying, you know what, I, I got this other guy in the back of my mind. Matthew, he already told you about him. So I'm going to focus in specifically on this Bartimaeus. And like you said, we don't get his name in Matthew and Luke, but Mark really wants us to know not merely his name, but also the name of his father, the son mm-hmm. of Timaeus. And that, the son of Timaeus, is really wanting to indicate to the crowd, to I'm sorry, to the audience of Mark, that this is somebody who Mark's audience, original audience, would have known among their community either somebody who has um, gone on to be with the Lord that just simply had a reputation in the church or even still living and saying, hey, remember him? You can actually go to him and ask him about this account, and it's going to be exactly how I have repeated it here. Uh, So he's wanting to help the people verify his account as being legitimate, and the church was doing this a lot. When we we remember that before the scriptures are – written for us, for our spiritual edification. They were written down to record the story of Jesus for their original building up, but also just as history. These things actually happened in a real time, in a real place, with real people. A man was really healed of his blindness. And then we look on what does this mean? The good old catechism question. Uh, What does this mean that Bartimaeus was, was healed? And then we can we can preach from that. But before we would preach on this text, we would just simply establish that, hey, guys, this actually happened. It happened to Bartimaeus. You know him. He's that guy who loves to play the old Greek tennis. I don't know. I'm just making things <laughs> up now. But <laughs> uh, so it's, it's a beautiful aspect of this text. Um, I'm reading right now Lord of the Rings, and it's amazing to me how – Aragorn is always Aragorn, son of Arathorn, and everybody, mm. whenever he says son of Arathorn, they like, oh yeah, that guy, he's the descendant of Isildur, the guy who originally killed Sauron. So mm. it's um, never let that son of expression kind of fall back. Yeah, I mean the fact that the fact that we actually get Bartimaeus's name, I think it does a couple things here. One, I, and I appreciate that that it, it sets the historicity of this text, and and it does. It's an indication that perhaps Bartimaeus and even his father Timaeus both would have been known to whoever you know Mark is writing. There's many who who would say that Mark writes to the church in Rome, and and so you know maybe Bartimaeus is well known to the church in Rome. You know maybe he's actually been a member of that church and to Maeus as well. It does it does strike as one of those places where you see the perhaps the hand of Peter. You know, Mark often is is considered to be getting his material from Peter, at least in, in the human way of speaking. And so, you know, Peter as an eyewitness would have perhaps known Bartimaeus's name or interacted with him later. You know, so I mean all of all of that is is anytime we see the names of people in scripture, we should pay attention. The other thing that strikes me about the fact that Bartimaeus gets named here in connection with what Mark's been doing so far, is that previously in chapter 10, Jesus had someone else come to him, this rich young man. And the rich young man, we don't ever learn his name, at least not not there in the text, whereas Bartimaeus is named. And when you think about those two guys, at least from a a human perspective, who is it that you would expect to be in higher standing? Well, the, the rich young man, right? He's got all the riches in the world. Bartimaeus, he's a blind beggar. And yet, which one is it that Mark names for us? Not the rich young man. He goes unnamed. This blind beggar, though, Bartimaeus, he does get named, which I think, again, invites us to reflect on, as you were saying, the what does this mean part. There's something about the way that Bartimaeus approaches Jesus that Mark wants us to pay attention to. This is the right way to do it not the way the rich young man came to Jesus. And one of the ways I think Mark indicates that is by naming Bartimaeus and not the rich young man. 
Yeah, absolutely. And um, then you can, this gets a little bit into the realm of speculation, but a good amount of the church tradition does label this rich young man as no less than Mark himself. Yeah. And so, um, which shows a, a mark, no pun intended, of Mark's <laughs> humility of um, saying, hey, I was the rich guy who got it wrong. Bartimaeus is the uh, poor guy who got it right. And then um, as the story unfolds for Mark, the same church tradition would label him as the uh, man at the Garden of Gethsemane who runs away naked. Uh, a lot of people think that that's Mark kind of putting his autograph on this gospel, right. um, saying, look, I was that rich man who was prideful and walked away in despair, but then I decided, you know what, I am going to give away everything that I have. And um, then he um, has to run away naked at the, at the um, uh, Garden of Gethsemane. And so, um, yeah, it's and it's um, absolutely the case. This rags to riches theme that we even see in this text, as Bartimaeus is not just blind, but he's a beggar. He's mm-hmm. destitute, and so this is definitely that that theme that you see a lot in Luke. The great reversal mm-hmm. theme mm-hmm. Um, that um, he takes the prideful and brings them low, and he takes the humble and lifts them up, uh, and. Uh, well, we'll unpack it a little bit more, but I, I think a good theme verse, as you think on the rags to riches of this story, Second Corinthians 8, verse 9, mm. where Paul says, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. And I'm sure we'll kind of unpack that as we keep going through the verses here. Yep, we're going to keep unpacking this account of blind Bartimaeus given sight by Jesus here on Sharper Iron. On the other side of the break, we got Pastor Kirk Cochran with us. We'll be right back. Please stick around. Since 1978, Lutheran Church Extension Fund has had the humble privilege of supporting Lutheran Church Missouri Synod Ministries and her workers. Thanks to faithful investors, LCEF has provided thousands of church workers, congregations, schools, and organizations with the low-cost loans and resources they need to reach more people with the saving name of Christ. To learn more, visit lcef.org or call 800-843-5233. 800-843-5233. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Thursday, March 4th. We're looking at Mark chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. We have Pastor Kirk, Kurt Cochran with us. He serves at Faith Lutheran Church in Tucson, Arizona. Pastor Cochran, prior to the break, we're talking about Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, this blind beggar by the roadside. And he hears that Jesus is coming by and he begins to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Take us into this prayer that Bartimaeus offers. Kyrie eleison, as we have it in the Greek. Yep. <laughs> in Greek and Latin, it's kind of both and. And this is the have mercy on me that you sing in church every single week, or at least you should, because it is the prayer of the church in many ways. Um, mercy is a catch-all word that, uh, on the one hand, just simply means everything that is good, that God would have to give is that which is merciful. Uh, Narrowly, you might say it refers to um, the opposite of grace, where grace means being given something that you don't deserve. Uh, Mercy means not receiving the punishment that you do deserve. So in a narrow sense, Bartimaeus is saying, have mercy on me. Uh, I deserve this blindness. Have mercy on me and take it from me. Or I deserve to be in a state of begging have mercy on me and take me from this punishment for my sins. And of course, not necessarily referring to his individual specific sins that he got blinded because he told a particular lie or something like that, or that his parents um, had a particular lie that they told that caused their son to be born. We see in John chapter nine with that healing of the blind man that no, that's not the reason. But Bartimaeus though is a sinner, just like you and I are sinners and we deserve punishment just as all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And by God's grace and mercy, he redeems us from our lowly states where we deserve this punishment. So mercy is huge. You could even say that it's, um, how it's, it encompasses 
each petition of the Lord's Prayer, where the Lord's Prayer is by all means the prayer of the church, what Jesus taught us in it. And you see in each petition how it connects to our faith. Well, mercy and the prayer, Lord, have mercy, is almost like you're praying the entire Lord's Prayer all at once. Mm, yeah. So it's such an important part of our worship uh, that we we should t- rejoice in it. And even if it's something that you might get a little bit, oh, nah, it's something we do every week kind of thing, um, as a bit of a rote um, tiredness with it. Uh, use this text, and every time this expression comes up in the in the scriptures, Lord have mercy. Use it to rejuvenate the love for this word, and even in your own prayers. Um, as Pastor Apple knows, I I had a um, kind of a crisis emergency that took place last night, and so I was praying this prayer a lot this morning. Mm. Lord have mercy, and it's um, and it's such a, a fantastic word that you can't get enough of, and in fact, he can't get enough of in the very next verse. He says it again, Uh, whenever he gets the shorthand um, with the crowd and and Jesus isn't recognizing him yet. He's being more obnoxious about it, obnoxious, rightly understood, of course. He's being more loud. He doesn't care what other people think about him. Um, He's just going to say again, son of David, have mercy on me. Hmm. That repetition that we see from Bartimaeus, I think you you see in the church all the time. And again, as you pointed out, at any time in our lives, this is an appropriate prayer for us. Lord, have mercy. When we are faced with a need, those should be the the three words that we utter. Lord, have mercy. That's a, a fine prayer. And even within the life of the church, this idea of repetition, I don't know that we ever say, Lord, have mercy just all by itself once. You know, I mean, and depending on if you use a different service of the a different setting of the divine service, say from Lutheran service book, you know, there's one where you go responsibly with the pastor in peace. Let us pray to the Lord, Lord have mercy. And it goes back and forth a couple of times. If you're using the, the one from the Lutheran hymnal that's in divine service setting three, even there, you know, it's Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. And how often is it in, even in the, the prayers of the church, you know, we, we repeat it. We don't just say it once. We ask for it continually. And, and that's true in the life of the church. That's true in our, our lives as individual, individual Christians. One thing I, I think we should take a look at in this text is that you know Bartimaeus does say, have mercy on me, but he doesn't actually use the title Lord. Here he uses the title Son of David. Now, we haven't actually seen this title in Mark yet. Uh, we know it, you know, Matthew makes a, a big deal of it in the first chapter of his gospel, but Mark, we haven't seen it. Uh, what What is the significance of the title Son of David? Well, Son of David connects just simply to the Second Samuel chapter 7 promise that the from David will come uh, the one who will have an everlasting kingdom. Um, that God is building David an everlasting house, a tabernacle. So it's it's simply he is declaring without any doubt, you are the long foretold Messiah hmm. who will come and heal the blind, who will come and make the lame to leap like a deer and, and all of the promises of of the prophets for, for what this Messiah is going to do. Um, and so it's son of David also has the connotations of Jesus being human. Um, he is not merely the son of God, which is what the um, centurion is going to give us at the foot of the cross, um, but that he's the son of David. Uh, but it's also got an aspect which you could say, well, if you are understanding the prophets, you are seeing hints of this Messiah is not merely man. For David said um, in the Psalms, um, the Lord said to my Lord, well, how can he call him both? Um, uh, the Son and, and, and Lord, uh, was because he is, in fact, God as well. So it's kind of an in-between word, I'd say, an in-between title between Son of Man and Son of God. Son of David encompasses both, but it especially hones in on the Messiah Christ aspect. This is the one who is long foretold. And I think it's quite something to see it from the lips of Bartimaeus here, the blind man calling Jesus the, essentially the Christ with the word, the son of David, that is what, you know, the disciples said to Jesus when he asked them, who do you say that I am? You are the Christ. And of course we've seen there, and, and here we're getting the idea of discipleship and, and what they, what they believe about Jesus. You know, we've seen their uh, somewhat blinded understanding of Jesus, even with that correct confession. 
here we have a blind man who who's confessing Jesus truly and then praying to Jesus truly, have mercy on me. Again, just a, a fantastic picture that we're getting from Bartimaeus of faith in, in a bit of contrast to that rich young man, in some contrast to the disciples themselves. Now, uh, one thing we haven't really talked about yet is the the setting of this. There's a The disciples are there. There's a great crowd following Jesus. And and this blind man Bartimaeus says to you know Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And the crowd says, "Hey, you know, be be quiet. Leave leave Jesus alone." Uh, what it, what is the the picture of the you know the the setting that we've got here that this is taking place, and and why is the crowd rebuking Bartimaeus for crying out? Sure. Uh, imagine with me um, the motorcade of of the president of the United States that. Um, uh, if you've ever turned out the numbers of how much Secret Service agents are, are around the president at any given time, it's astronomical, mostly for the sake of his safety, yes, but also because the president is an important person and he's got jobs to do, people to see, and agreements to have uh, to make with other countries. And so he doesn't want mere beggars on the street to come and, and disturb his work. And so that's the um, people seeing Jesus as the not merely the healing Messiah, not merely the salvation Messiah, but a lot of people with weak faith thinking of this Jesus going to be the one who overthrows the Jewish or the uh, Roman authorities and um, take names and set up a, a new earthly kingdom. Uh, so they like he's got a mission to lead a rebellion here. You need to. Um, blind Bart, you need to, to move away, move on the side. I understand you're, you're begging, but for this time, you need to let your begging take a back seat. That's kind of the, the context, and Jesus is going to have none of it because he came specifically for the destitute, um, and he, Bartimaeus is destitute, and he realizes it. I think Bart actually really does believe that Jesus is going to hear him and actually do something. He's got this faith that expects good to come from Jesus because he believes he is the one who's long foretold to help specifically him blind people. He makes the blind to see. So he's like, I understand you're telling me to be silent, but I can't. Um, In fact, we have hereafter the triumphal entry, which we don't get it in Mark. We get it in Luke Uh, at the end of the triumphal entry. Luke tells us how the Pharisees tell Jesus, hey, make all your all these people, all these children who are shouting out to you, make them be quiet. You're going to rouse up a, a, a controversy here in the city. And Jesus says, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. You can't keep from proclaiming, from confessing, from praising your faith, your God. Uh, and so this Bartimaeus, he's told to be silent, but he doesn't want any of it. And this ties in with some of the secrecy of Mark stuff that you guys have probably been talking about quite a bit. So I'm not going to, we don't necessarily need to go there right now. Um, I also didn't do much study on it, but, (laughs) uh, but that is something that is worth taking note of is um, the people, whenever they rebuke him, uh, another way you can translate that word rebuke is many charged him to be silent, which does have reminiscences of Jesus charging the people to be silent um that is to say to to keep his popularity down so that his uh he's not going too quickly to the cross you might say and there's a lot of of things that you can talk on on that but nevertheless though uh this bartimaeus is is a model of a, a faith for us and so as we keep on going through the verses you'll see this even more yeah, the fact that it is the crowd who's charging Bartimaeus to be silent, as opposed to say when Jesus had done that previously, I I think does invite a bit of a reflection that we see that something's changing here in terms of of where Jesus is in his ministry. The the to use John's language, the hour is about to be here. You know, when he when he enters into Jerusalem, the hour is coming for all these things to come together for the the confession of Jesus and who he truly is to be to begin to be made public and everything that's going to happen in Holy Week. Oh, this is one of those places you're talking about uh, the rebuking and the the charging to be quiet. I'm reminded of of just what's happened previously in Mark chapter 10 with children. Like you said, in, in Luke's gospel, you get it after Palm Sunday. And we've already talked a little bit about children here in this chapter. The disciples were trying to prevent the children 
from coming to Jesus, sort of that that same idea that you know Jesus, you're you're too important for this. You're you're the Christ. What does the Christ have to do with with children? And we we talked a little bit about you know maybe there is some of that thought of a political Messiah going through their minds. Here again, that same thing seems to be happening. And, and what I mean, just what a wonderful thing that that the Christ Himself. What did He come to do? He came to welcome children. He came to heal the blind. And and even going all the way back to Mark chapter 2, when the Pharisees and scribes are upset at Jesus for who he's eating with, who did Jesus come for? He came for sinners. And, and what a marvelous thing that is, that this you know, most important person in the world, I mean, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm standing there in the presidential motorcade and I, I'm saying, hey, President Biden, I need to talk to you, he's not going to stop for me. But, but Jesus stops for Bartimaeus. That's just a wonderful picture of that mercy that Bartimaeus is asking for. Yeah, and, and you tie it back in also Mark ten forty five, where yeah. Jesus said, The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. And Jesus is constantly, in thinking on his, his reign of God that he's bringing to earth, um, you don't want to think of Jesus as... Uh, you can Google this one if you want to, the Oedipus Rex, um, the <laughs> big, lazy, idle, fat king who just simply is given all of his food and doesn't really do much for the people. No, that's not what Jesus is about. He's the uh, king who actually gets there with his people, um, hearing their concerns and then, well, hearing them, inviting them as children into the royal court. And that's, I mean, huge when you think on who is Bartimaeus. Well, he's going to be made into a child of the Heavenly Father, a brother of Jesus. He is a prince who is able to come into the royal throne and ask for whatever he wishes, such as your faith as well, dear Christians listening to our program here, that you are invited when you are commanded to pray. That's the king inviting you into his court to hear uh, what it is that you have concerns about, what you want to petition the king for. Mm. And he wants to hear you and then actually actually wants to give you, not as a, oh, a slave would ask for something from a master, but rather a son asking from a father. Mm. Yeah, our father who art in heaven. I mean, they're, they're, you get both of those things coming together right there in the Lord's prayer that who is it that we are petitioning? We are petitioning the one who is in heaven, who is the king overall. I get to come into the king's presence and ask for the great riches of his storehouse that he has open for me. And yet the king is not some distant person, but he is in fact my father. And the reason he's my father is because his son is my brother, Jesus Christ. And so, I mean, this, this really is just a fantastic picture of the mercy that Jesus is already having on Bartimaeus, even before he does anything for Bartimaeus and his sight, he's already having mercy by simply acknowledging him and by inviting him to come and, and to present his request. And so, and it's quite, I, I don't know, it, it makes me chuckle a little bit when, when Jesus stops and says, call him, then suddenly the crowd almost does this about face. You know, they were saying, yeah, be, be quiet. And then like, oh, hey, he wants to talk to you. I don't know. I don't know. Is there anything there it's other than just a bit of irony? <laughs> yeah, well, there, there is definitely something there. Um, and I got an analogy of um, President Trump. One of the things that were a little comical, if you um, were in the news on this, is that there were times where President Trump had his plans and then he decided, you know what, I'm going to do something else instead. Uh, which is he's got totally the prerogative to do that. Um, President Biden can do that as well. Um, but that causes the Secret Service to have to then change their plans completely. Okay. Um, OK, they they had the whole motorcade procession planned for this route. And now the the next hour, things are changing. And so um, they've got to change the plans for him. Uh, so in a similar way, Jesus is saying, OK, well, now I actually do want to hear from this Bartimaeus. Call him. And so the, the people around him, the disciples, then say, oh, oh that, that, now's our task. Now's our time to come and, and see. Um, of course, there's oh, some pride. They never expected Jesus to actually hear from this man. The crowd saying, this guy's not going to listen to you. Even the disciples um, were at first more hardened on this. Uh, and so then they now are saying, okay, well, hey, take heart. Get up. 
he is calling you. It's kind of worth honing in on, on those expressions there. Uh, take heart or be of good cheer. Um, have courage. Um, this is absolution language even, uh, which is coming on the basis of Jesus just simply saying, call him. The disciples know, all right, he, we are called to be the ones who give the mercy of Jesus to others. So now we're going to give the take heart, which has implied he's ready to forgive you of your sins and he's ready to help you and be there for you. So we actually see, I think, even repentance from the crowd, uh, from the disciples saying, okay, we were wrong with telling him to be silent, but now take heart, get up, um, arise. That word get up is even a, a resurrection kind of a word. Get up, he is calling you. And and Bartimaeus does just that. He throws, I mean, you just can sense his excitement in verse 50 as he throws off his cloak. He, he springs up, comes to Jesus. Yeah, that cloak is worth taking note as a beggar, as a, as a blind beggar. That cloak is important to him. It keeps him warm and, and so forth. Um, but he is ready to receive any good gift that would come from Jesus. And we think about what good gift would Jesus be giving to him? Well, he's already given the gift of his presence, bringing him forward. And this blind man, he's probably thinking, you know what? I, I don't know what he's going to do for me, but I asked for mercy. And so he's ready to give me some mercy. So if he wants to give me my sight back, excellent. But if he even just wants to give me a little food or even just a word that says, hang in there, I'm going to the cross to die for your sins or something of the sort. Um, he is just ecstatic to receive any good thing from God, which is a good example for us in our lives that we don't know what's going to come for us good from God in time. But we do know from eternity, in eternity, he'll give us everything good, the full redemption of our bodies and a complete escape from this sinful world. But in time, he is going to give us good things. What good thing is he going to give us? Well, we wait and see with faith and with hope. We just simply have the excitement of Bartimaeus that he will give us good things no matter what, because that is his goal his that's his desire is to give good things to his children even while having to say at times hold on i'm going to keep you with your blindness i'm going to keep you with your cancer uh for a time but the time is coming where you will be redeemed you will have a little resurrection maybe in this life but you will most definitely have a final resurrection in the life to come that question that Jesus asks Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? That was the same question he just asked James and John in the previous text. You know, they, they come to Jesus and say, hey, we want you to do whatever we ask. And Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? And I, I think that invites us to compare and contrast. What are James and John asking? How are they coming to Jesus versus how is Bartimaeus coming? And, and we see here, you know, this is the way to come to Jesus, not with this desire for some sort of earthly glory or greatness, but rather simply with a desire to receive the mercy from Jesus in whatever way he desires to give. And, and I think, you know, I mean, Bartimaeus asks very specifically, you know, let me see again. Let me recover my sight. So it's not wrong to ask for that kind of specific mercy from Jesus by any means. But the, the point is that Bartimaeus is coming to Jesus with faith that whatever the son of David will do for him in his mercy, that will be good. That will be right for him. Yeah, and you probably talked about this on your last segment, but notice as well the the softness, the gentleness in the rebuke of Jesus back in chapter uh, 10, verse 38, where after G James and John say, uh, we want to, you to do for us whatever we ask of you, Jesus entertains them. What do you want me to do for you? The same question he asks to Bartimaeus. And James and John says, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Now, Jesus, if he's me, if I'm Jesus in this sense, I am, I'm telling him down. Like, I'm, all right, guys, you, you guys are, are really got your heads up in the clouds here. Uh, but no, Jesus says, you don't know what you're asking. Um, it's kind of like when Jesus is on the cross, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Uh, Jesus gives them a gentle rebuke, but it's still a rebuke. You don't know what you are asking. But notice Jesus doesn't tell them, I'm not. I, I'm, all right. Jesus doesn't say you shouldn't have asked me. He invites their request, but he is teaching James and John. The answer might not be yes. Yeah. 
But we learn from this account with Bartimaeus, the answer very well could, and for Bartimaeus, it was absolutely. I would be delighted to give you back your sight. Go your way. Your faith has made you well. Your faith has saved you. So uh, we should be invited, encouraged to ask whatever is on our heart. Do some discernment, of course. If you're asking for adultery, know that that's sinful. But if you are asking for um, something that's neutral, um, ask. If you're asking for the Kansas City Chiefs to win the Super Bowl, um, then ask for it. And the Lord delights to hear, even if his answer might be, well, not yet, maybe wait another three years to the Chiefs, but uh, but nevertheless, he's glad to hear our requests. He's glad to hear um, he's glad to hear our requests for for healing in, in time because this is helpful for us. Mm. Uh, just so you know, Pastor Cochran, we've got about four minutes here. So a, a couple oh, sure. more more things to look at just briefly. Jesus response, go your way. Your faith has made you well. We should talk a little bit about that. And I also want to make sure we get to that last thing that Mark says that Bartimaeus actually followed Jesus on the way. So take us into both of those. Yeah, so we'll go with this real quickly then. In the Greek, uh, your faith has made you well. The Greek word is sozo, which is saved, also saved. But it can be both and. Your faith has made you well or saved. Which is it in our minds? We want to kind of label one or the other. Um, and the answer is simply both and. Jesus is giving Bartimaeus both the spiritual blessing of um, grace and mercy, and, and what comes with that is eternal life through the forgiveness of sins, But he's also giving this physical healing of his blindness being made well. So uh, we want to keep in mind that when we're asking God in our prayers, we tend, we ask for either or spiritual blessings or temporal blessings. We ask for his name to be hallowed in the Lord's Prayer. We ask for his kingdom to come. But we also ask for our daily bread. And this is good. So be encouraged to ask for both spiritual and temporal blessings. And even though his answer to your temporal blessings might be, I'm not going to heal your wife yet. I'm going to have you take up your cross in order to follow me. Nevertheless, though, we expect that good will come soon. How soon is in his counsel? And so we want to lift up our prayer that says, according to your will. Um, but we, 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 it would be good to expect good from him, um, even with the temporal blessings. He promises to deliver us from evil. He doesn't say when. We want to sometimes automatically go just simply to life after death and think that I'm just going to suffer with this particular cross until I die and that's it, and that I'm just going to despair. But he may very well deliver you even before then. Hmm. Know that your God is good. Your God is your Father now, and he delights to even have a bit of heaven come to you, a little resurrection come to you, even in this life. With just about a minute, Pastor Cochran, take us into that very last thing that Mark tells us, that Bartimaeus recovered his sight and followed Jesus on the way. And use that as a way to wrap things up this morning. Sure. I mean, followed is the big disciple word. Uh, Take up your cross and follow me. Um, This man is given a little resurrection, and he could have said, as we are might be inclined to do, oh, he declared that I'm saved. Therefore, I'm once saved, always saved. I'm going to go home, kick kick up my feet and not do anything. Um, But no, he says, I have been given a great gift that I don't deserve. Therefore, I am going to take my new sight and use it in faith towards God, this Jesus, learning more from him at his feet, and also in love for my neighbor. Now I have eyes to be able to see and serve my neighbor in a better way, in a more um, full way. Uh, so he is then following Jesus, listening to what he uh, can continue to believe, continue to learn, and also then to learn how to love even more. Pastor Kurt Cochran is the pastor at Faith Lutheran Church in Tucson, Arizona, helping us this morning with Mark chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. Pastor Cochran, thanks for being our guest today. Thank you so much. This was a delight. Take care. I'm your host here on Sharp Iron, Pastor Tim of the Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. If you have questions about Mark chapter 10 or any of the gospel according to St. Mark, send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again tomorrow.